but looking at these two new inmates and saying, why are you so sad? Can I help you? Please let's talk about it. What a pastor. These people, if anything, are in a much worse situation because they haven't found favor with the jailer. They're not in charge of the prison. They're not even in charge of their own hygiene. They can't move. They can't stand up. They can't, they can't use their feet. So what do you do in a situation like that? Well, I, it's, isn't it obvious? They sang hymns. They praised God. Can you imagine? And it was at that moment that there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were fastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, don't harm yourself, we're all here. Now there are two miracles here. One miracle is the earthquake, which opened the doors of the prison and shook the, the shackles and the stocks off. That's one miracle. The other miracle is that the other prisoners did not run away. When you consider the phenomena of the, of the ark and the flood, there's more than one miracle there. One, one of the mir greatest miracles is that the animals came on and didn't tear the place apart. That was a miracle. Those animals had to be pacified and sedated by God for the thing to work. Those prisoners had to be pacified and sedated by God for this thing to work in Philippi, and they were. And those prisoners, who were probably not religious, but they were superstitious, they knew these men are different. And they knew that the earthquake came because of those men. And they knew that the chains fell off because of those men. I don't know how many there were. Maybe there were two. Maybe there were 22. I don't know how many they were. But they each concluded, we're not going anywhere without them. If they go, we go. If they stay, we stay. Whatever we do, we don't want to offend their God. That's the last. Offending Rome is nothing compared to that. Okay? Now, the, the controversy which we are gripped by, which requires us to go to the airport two hours early, which requires us to take our belt and shoes off, which delays us interminably, which increases the cost of flying, the controversy which currently convulses the world and threatens our safety is a controversy over death it's a controversy over what death means. It's a controversy which began in the Garden of Eden. When Eve says to the serpent, well, you know, we can't eat from the tree of that fruit, the fruit of that tree, because if we do, we're going we're gonna to die. And the serpent says, you shall not die. Well, somebody's lying. Think of the first situation in Eden. Death was nowhere. Uh, everything combined to inspire a prolific, pulsating, multiplying life. The microscopic world, the microorganisms, the insect world, the animal world, the elements, the weather, everything combined, not only to allow life of the first human pair, but to enhance their life and make it something wonderful. And they'd never seen anybody die, because no one had ever died. So when God said, if you eat that fruit, you're going to die, what's that? Why should I be afraid of that? Death only existed in one place. It existed in the warning of God. 100% of their knowledge of death came from the warning of God. And the warning was this, the only way you can die 
is by taking in that one fruit on that one tree. That's the only way you can die. And they didn't heed the warning. Now, you're all missionaries. And um, you're committed to ministry. You're committed to the evangelization of the world. The Great Commission is precious to you. You want to become all things to all men that you might by any means, by every means, rescue some. And uh, you're in the exact converse of the situation in Eden. Death is everywhere. Uh, the 100% experience of all organ organisms is death. You want to blame God for the death of a child? Well, just wait. Wait to the end of the generation. Everybody dies. You want to blame God for that death? You can blame him for all deaths because everybody dies. Unless we're alive when Jesus comes, which I pray we would be, we either die or we watch everybody else die. I know that sounds morbid, but it's a fact, and we need to face it. It's realism. And uh, there's life in only one place. There's life which overwhelms death. Death always overwhelms life, except in one place. Life only overcomes death in one man who hangs on one tree. And that if we take in that man, we can never die. We can never die. Now one gospel says, uh, let me tell you what, why people die, and let me tell you how you can avoid an unpleasant death. If you, and, I, and I realize uh, that you know, I'm making a distinction between Muslims who are much nicer neighbors than I would ever be and jihadists and Islamists. I, I, I understand that. The problem is if only 1% of Muslims have jihadist tendencies, that would be the largest army in the history of the world. That's the problem. And so one gospel says, if you die making jihad then you will have a paradise of sexual indulgence forever now I know this is a little bit oh, we're almost done I know this is a little bit um, awkward but um, theologically I can only say that uh, male and female fell to the same depth I have no authorization to say that we're at different levels of fallenness. We're at the same level. I know that. But practically, it seems like, seems like men fell deeper. And let me, let me tell you two reasons I say that. A man is much more likely to settle a quarrel violently than a woman. I'm not saying there are no male pacifists. I'm not saying there are no women who won't tear you apart. I'm just saying that on average, there's a higher percentage of males who will resort to violence to deal with a controversy than there are women. Second way, um, in that marital, in that physical romantic intimacy that God uh, reserves for marriage, a higher percentage of women require a relationship to frame the act. A higher percentage of men are quite satisfied with an act with no relationship. That doesn't mean that there are no female prostitutes. That doesn't mean that there are no male monogamist and faithful covenant keepers. Of course there are, and I hope we have a room full of them. But what it means that on a percentage basis, men are much more likely to be promiscuous with their sexuality than with a woman. Now what's this got to do with what I'm talking about? Just this. The promise of 72 virgins forever as a reward for the, to those who are killing for Allah. You know what? That doesn't sound to me like the best thing God can think of. That doesn't sound to me like the best thing God can dream up to reward his stalwarts, his champions. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like the worst thing that men think about. Really getting even with somebody that is opposing me and unlimited relationless sex forever. 
That's not the best in God. That's the worst in men. And so one gospel says if that infidel, if that infidel doesn't uh, confess that Allah is God and Muhammad is his prophet, then if he, he's either going to pay heavy taxes or we're going get to him in, get him into hell as soon as possible. That's one gospel. The other gospel says if the unbeliever doesn't repent, do everything you can to, to preserve his life. Do everything you can to preserve his life, to keep him along long enough to believe in our Jesus somewhere down the line so he can join us in heaven, so he can avoid hell. Even if you need to die first, if you can die before he does to prolong his life, do it. Because that's one reason we're left on this planet, to preserve the life of others so that they can join us in heaven. Now, those two gospels could not be more opposite one of those Gospels is from hell. So, the jailer sees that the doors are open and the stocks have fallen apart. In Acts 12, Peter got out and Herod killed Peter's guards. This jailer in Philippi knows that he's going to be executed because those inmates escaped and it's probably going to take a long time and it's probably going to be torture and it's probably going to be very unpleasant so he's just going to finish it so he raises the sword and Paul says don't do it we're all here we're all present and accounted for you don't have to kill yourself We're willing to die instead of you. Now, if you want to understand the key to missions, I'd love to talk about this in another 30 minutes, but I'm going to say this and we're done. If you want, here's the key to missions. The key to understanding missions is understanding the reason Paul and Silas didn't leave. If you understand that, you're going to understand the heart of missions, okay? And the reason they didn't leave is because they were already free. They had come to free the jailer been a joy to be with you. God bless you and your important service to him.